As the Tokyo Olympics come to an end this weekend, uh, you know, health officials there are still concerned about the lasting effects of the global event happening in Japan in the midst of the coronavirus. Today, Olympic organizers reported 29 new COVID cases linked to the Games. The host city continues to see a surge in new infections, reporting just over 4,000 cases today. So let's bring in Jamie Yukis, who is in Tokyo with us. Good evening to you, Jamie. Um, so we'll quickly touch on what's happening with COVID and then get into the details of the games. But um, do we know anything more about the recent cases? Well, so I think it's, you know, it's one of these interesting things that the majority of the cases that you're seeing pop up connected to the Olympic Games are vendors and other people who are coming in and out. They are Japanese citizens, uh, for the most part, who are getting COVID and then taking it home to their families or potentially they're getting it uh, from their families and bringing it then to the Olympic Games. And you have to remember, there are so few people here vaccinated. This was a, a country where it was about 27 percent vaccination rate when the Olympic Games started. So you have people who who are coming to work and and trying to go to the Olympics and they're still doing the testing procedures and everything else uh, just like the athletes and and those of us covering the games uh, so these cases I think have stayed relatively the same we've seen between 20 and 30 cases a day with the majority of them being workers and other people uh, when they are associated with the games I think the bigger concern for the country is that there has been this new spike in cases not just in Tokyo but in other major metro metropolitan areas as well where they're talking about potentially a nationwide lockdown. Uh, Tokyo has had a lockdown itself in the city because of the Olympic Games, because more people were starting to move around, because the cases were going up, and because the Delta variant is starting to show up in some at some places 80% of the time uh, in those cases. So that's really what they've been concerned about. And going forward, you know, these games are going to end. We're going to get to the closing ceremonies over the weekend, and this country is going to have to still deal uh, with COVID and the fact that they don't have that many people vaccinated. Yeah, so closing ceremonies on Sunday, opening ceremonies were, I, I suppose, you know, memorable for the lack of pomp and circumstance. Obviously, there were there were no uh, audience. There was no, nobody in the audience to witness it. And people even sort of talked about being able to hear the protesters outside of the stadium, you know, almost as loud as right. the opening ceremony. So what's on tap for the closing ceremonies? It's going to look similar. You know, the closing ceremonies in the past have been these big productions and it's a celebration. If you remember in Rio, it was dancing and lights and music and just a huge almost concert uh, to end things. And, and in a celebratory way, they put out the flame. That's the symbolic move to then move to the next Olympic Games, which, of course, the next Summer Games will be 2024 in Paris. Uh, however, I think this will look a lot like those opening ceremonies that you're talking about, where it will be much more subdued. They said the themes will be the the same, you know, hope, moving forward and taking into account just what the athletes have had to go through. You know, we were talking at the beginning of these games, how the athletes had really had to alter their training and just how hard the last year had been and delaying the games. Then I think it was, you know, symbolic that we had all of these discussions around mental health and Simone Biles talking about what a struggle it's been. You have people like Caleb Dressel, who's this superstar swimmer, you know, tearing up when he sees his family on camera because we are are still dealing with COVID and there are still uh, these repercussions. So I think in the closing ceremony, you will still see that somber um, kind of feel to it. And then, you know, we'll be moving on and they'll have to they'll have to kind of, you know, we, we got to hope that by 2024, those Paris games, we're not all still wearing masks and that the world has been vaccinated and we've started <laughs> to move forward in some way. Yeah, from your uh, lips to God's ears, as they say. Um, so quick <laughs> recap, or it brings up to speed when it comes to some of the headlines. The Belarusian um, athlete who uh, sought refuge in the, at the uh, Polish embassy, she's now out of the country after she says that she was being forced to leave the Olympics. Two coaches have lost their accreditation, Belarusian uh, coaches. Yeah, that's isn't this story just so fascinating? I feel like every day we do have an update to it. Yeah. And in this case, you may remember that the young sprinter, uh, the female sprinter, that she, you know, had posted the stuff on social media, uh, really attacking the coaching staff, saying, you know, they're asking me to run a race I've never done before. I usually do shorter races. And then all of a sudden these coaches showed up at her room uh, and told her, you know, pack your bags. I'm taking you to the airport. And so it's the two coaches involved in that situation that the International Olympic Committee has said, you 
you know what? We'd like you to now step aside. We're doing our investigation, but while we do that, we need you to just kind of move, uh, you know, over while we do that. They did. They said that they uh, had no problem stepping down and, and moving on uh, from this situation while the investigation is completed. Um, so that's where we're at at this point in time. I'm sure we will continue to hear about this case uh, and what happens. But as you did state too, the sprinter is now back in Poland after making kind of a, a pit stop in Vienna because they were concerned about her security. So this this has many layers and is going to be something that we talk about for a while. Jamie, we always talk to you when it's nighttime there, so it looks so pleasant. But it, it seems like in the daytime, <laughs> it's it's brutal in terms of the heat. Um, I know that the, the men's 50-kilometer walk had to, like, move to a place where they thought was going to be cooler. It turned out not to be. I just wanted to find out, before we let you go, just what is the weather like there? Oh, my goodness. It is so oppressive. I have to tell you, I think even right now it's in the upper 80s with 90 percent humidity. My phone today, I had three times where I'm just walking with my phone and it turned off saying it needed to cool down. Um, it's really the humidity wow. here, and that's why you're seeing sporting events uh, be moved, you know, to other times of the day. The marathon's going to get started a little bit earlier to, to try to give uh, those runners a break. But, you know, we saw it with tennis. They had to move it later in the day. It's re it is really hot. It's very oppressive, and especially when you're talking about those road surfaces or in the case of tennis those clay surfaces you know they can really hold the heat and it's just brutal mm, all right um jamie well stay cool and thank you <laughs> <laughs> you got it